Now, literature review comes in two forms. You can do literature review as a research on its own and publish. Or what is most popular with us, especially students, is that literature review is an embedded section within our research report that you write for our final um, graduation, okay? So whether it is going to be an embedded section within your research or whether you will do literature review solely as a paper to publish, what is the literature review and how is it done? What is the best way of using other people's text? You realize that under the description of this particular link, I also shared a link to an external source of a MOOC, a MOOC by INASP that has to do with critical thinking because it is very important for you to acquire critical thinking skills in order to engage academically or critically with literature. That kind of engagement is what allows you to be able to write, write eloquently and argue your own views out by pointing out either flaws in the arguments of other writers or similarities or arguments in terms of controversy in the field among various other authors, and then why you think that your own view also needs to be paid attention to. So literature review is not simply summarizing each material that you read and putting it down there just to populate your pages, that you have oh, five pages, 10 pages, or 20 pages, no, no, no. It is about where you engage academically within the field of your research and show proof that one, you are well read and you are well knowledgeable in the field that you have chosen to research into and that your views are also worth noting within that scholarly field or the discourse, all right? So it is more of an argumentative essay. Literature review is an argumentative one. It is not just a matter of passively quoting people and then moving away. So let's see how it is done. Thank you. Right, so the concept of literature review, we are going to cover what it is, why we do it, when to conduct it, then what are the steps involved in the process of review. And we'll be focusing under the steps on evaluating the sources, the critical appraisal and related bibliography related to literature review, literature analysis or synthesis. Then we'll look also at the review matrix as examples of ways of organizing your review then how do you outline or structure your review or the knowledge that you have acquired from the text that you have evaluated and then we'll be looking at that uh, in terms of concept maps and mind maps and uh, problem analysis or whatever all right so when we talk about literature review okay rather than going into a definition what i did was to try and look at the various words that have been used to describe literature review. And the word cloud that you are seeing here gives you an idea of the kinds of things that go into literature review or its definition. The biggest or the most uh, you know, loud of these words from the cloud tells you how frequently it was mentioned in several definitions. So, of course, literature review is about previous research. You see, it's the biggest in terms of character, the boldest. So it means that we are going to be dealing with previous research, things that others have already done, all right? And one interesting other thing that came up is about research question. So research question is also very important. It means that while you are evaluating or reviewing those texts, you are doing so in the light of your own research question. That means your review must be answering the research question that you post, all right? Or you must be justifying why your research question or problem needs to be studied. Then it also mentioned field of study. That means you need to really be narrowly focused in your field. You will not go and do a literature review discursively meandering away from the core focus of your topic, no. And one thing that you do with the research uh, reviews or literature review 
is to clarify. Okay, you can see all these words here. You are going to be clarifying concepts. You are going to analyze other people's words and you'll be addressing gaps, things that have not been seen. You'll be showing them. You'll be highlighting controversies. You'll be summarizing people's arguments and you look for emerging issues in the field. Then you overall synthesize. That means you bring all these things together to form a new idea. As you can see, one of the important roles of literature review is to identify gaps in established knowledge. So what is the knowledge that has been established on your topic? Now, what gaps are there? If there are no gaps, then why do you think your research is important? Your paper or your research is supposed to fill a gap in the knowledge in that particular field or discourse. And so you must make sure you are getting relevant items, things that relate to your research topic, and you are going to be evaluating them, and you are going to be dealing with concepts, and you will acknowledge, this is a very important one, you will be acknowledging the various sources that you have consulted. You don't simply just go and make arguments. While you are making the arguments, you make sure that you are actually acknowledging those who you are citing or who you are referring to. That acknowledgement is what you are going to be dealing with in the afternoon session when we look at how to use the Mendeley app to do our citations and referencing. You are going to be describing, you objectively evaluate other people's knowledge and you expose the current knowledge on an issue. And at the bottom here, very important, relationships. You should be able to establish relationships between various fields. Don't forget <coughs> that you are reading several people's writings. And if you do a very good analysis of your literature, you come to realize that different people may be speaking on the same tangent or they will be converging on a particular truth, while at other times they may be contradicting each other on certain things. Those are the things that you uncover and illuminate in your literature review. And then while you are doing that, you are going to be justifying your own uh, topic's relevance or the significance of your own study and why it is worth undertaking. So that is what literature review is about in summary, as you can see in this word cloud. So why do we do the literature review? One, it proves your familiarity with the research landscape of your chosen field, okay? So in literature review, don't forget, first of all, <coughs> you'll be giving us a background of your topic. That should prove that you are actually familiar with your chosen field, whatever topic you have chosen. What is the research landscape in that field? You should be able to tell us what is the current knowledge, what are the controversies, what are the agreements that have been reached so far on certain issues in that area. And then while you are doing all those things, you are also fusing into your argument why your own research that you are doing goes to either add to the knowledge or enhance understanding or bring a different view to what is already known in the field, all right? So that is about demonstrating your familiarity with the field. It also positions your study within a scholarly context and demonstrates its value and significance, as I already mentioned. You know, once you are able to do a review that is relevant and rich, automatically your reader knows that you know what you are doing because your own topic then is well fit within the context of the discourse in that field. And it helps clarify your topic, formulate questions, and choose appropriate methods. Very important. You know, sometimes the review that you do initially is to help you understand your own question. I'll give you an example. One of our nursing students once approached me with an idea of a topic, all right? And her topic was she wanted to address, I think from VT, when they returned from vocational training, she made some observations about handing over, uh, you know, between the hospital shift staff and all of that. So she came with the topic or idea, handover syndrome. That's how she put it. Then I said, okay, fine. In order to establish your knowledge or understanding of what you are trying to describe, let us do an initial search to find out this handover syndrome that you want to discuss. Has it ever been discussed in the nursing literature? So we just did a regular Google search. We got some Wikipedia results 
Wikipedia, of course, is an encyclopedia, it's a tertiary source. So it's going to give us objective ideas about a thing, but we cannot cite Wikipedia itself as a source. And so we'll look at other sources, secondary sources, publications that Wikipedia has itself referenced. You understand? So when I took her through that, then we realized that the handover syndrome that she mentioned, even though there are similar concepts, in the entire literature, nobody uses the word handover. Okay, the expression in the nursing field have been shift handoff, uh, change of shift, all manner of expressions except the handover that she used. You understand? So that alone helped her to realign her own uh, research idea because every single field of knowledge has its own special jargon. Okay, there are special ways of referring to concepts and issues in our various fields. And so it helped her to actually get an idea of how exactly in nursing that concept or phenomenon that he, she wanted to deal with is referred to. So that is what happens when you do your literature review. It helps you to clarify your own topic and it helps you to become familiar with the necessary jargon or terminologies that are used in the field so that you don't go uh, using layman language too much, but you fit yourself within the scholarly communication space. Then of course, you can see the Google Scholar uh, button that I placed there with the inscription, stand on the shoulders of giants. That is actually the Google Scholar sl slogan. And of course, that is what a literature review does. Literature review helps you to stand on the shoulders of giants. And I hope that you understand that expression. Okay, it's a proverb which was attributable to um, Isaac Newton when uh, he was supposed to have, you know, developed someone else's theory further and he was being accused. And he said simply, oh, he did not, you know, claim to be the father of all knowledge. And that, of course, it is true that he has also read from other people. And if he's able to see further, it is because he is a dwarf on the shoulders of giants. Have you seen it? It's an interesting thing. So yes, a giant can see further than a dwarf. But when that dwarf stands on the shoulders of giants, of course, the dwarf will see further than the giant. That is a whole idea, okay, or illustration of this. So we must understand that the reason why we do a review is because we want to situate our own study within the context of what is already known among scholars and also learn from these scholars on how to even express ourselves and shape our own discussion within the discourse. So in literature review, these are the things you'll be doing. And these also constitute how you choose a research problem. Okay, in choosing a research problem, you should be sure that a gap actually exists. Because of course, you cannot go and do a research on what has already been done. If the thing has been done already, then what you'll be doing is duplication. And nobody wants to duplicate knowledge in a particular field. So your problem must actually exist as a gap in knowledge. That qualifies it as a researchable problem, all right? There must be a gap in knowledge. And that is what you are going to be justifying with your literature review. You also justify the relevance of your work. How relevant? even if you must listen to you, is it necessary listening to you? You need to justify that in literature review. Then agency of need. In fact, the problem that you really want to study, can you prove that if we don't pay attention to it now, something bad may happen? Okay, how agent is it? Is it really necessary doing that kind of research? Otherwise, you see, many people do research and nobody ever reads it. Okay, they are just things you've done, you have done, they are packed in shelves, Later, they are given to granule sellers because nobody has seen the relevance or the need for it. It's just a matter of putting words together. No, research must not be like that, all right? Especially for you guys who are professionally health experts. Your research must tackle exigent problems, all right? So that they are relevant and useful to the Minister of Health, to your department, to whoever needs them, even to academia the research community, all right? Then you'll be justifying 
whether research is needed to solve that particular problem that you are actually bringing up. Then you also prove that you are not duplicating anybody. Then political acceptance. The point is, you want your research to be implemented. Now, what kind of study are you doing? Is this something that policymakers should be interested in? If policymakers are interested in your topic, then you can be sure that they will accept it. Then it must also be ethically conducted, <coughs> especially when you are using human subjects. Sometimes we feel that, oh, me, my thing doesn't involve any experimentation with human beings or animals and whatever. No, ethical clearance is always very key, okay? Because you may never know. You start an interview right now, and then personal issues come up. So you always need to make sure that when you are conducting your research is ethical. You have to prove all these things when you are doing your literature discussion. Then feasibility and other things are also things you have to justify. And applicability, how applicable is your study? Will it be able to change something, change a behavior, change a situation, improve a process at the hospital or in your community outreach or whatever it is that you are doing? You should pay attention to all these things so that when you select a problem to study, it is a pragmatic problem. It's something that goes to actually affect your community of practice. All right. All right. So those are the things, the elements that are involved in literature review. Now, when do you conduct literature review? Immediately after conceiving your research idea, you must try to do a study around it so that you understand what is already known in that area. Then you will carve a niche for your own research by identifying gaps within that field of knowledge and you'll be able to formulate appropriate research questions and choose the methods that can actually help you prosecute your topic. Okay, so immediately you conceive a research idea, you must begin to read around it so that you know what is already existing. Then you will not repeat anybody's work. Now, it is also important in answering the questions that drive your theoretical study. Now, a theoretical study here is more about what you are reading from other people or the literature review itself, all right? Usually when you write questions for your research, your research questions, there's a particular question that is driving your theoretical research or your literature review. There are other questions that drive your empirical research or the one that leads you to collect field data and try to analyze, interpret, and bring new ideas. So when you are doing a review, you must make sure you are actually answering that theoretical question that you post. Because if your literature review does not answer that question, then it is not a useful review. Okay? And also remember that in doing literature review, there is no start and finish point. Okay? It is iterative. That means you keep going back and forth. Sometimes while you are even interpreting your data, that is when you realize that there are some key principles that you missed in your literature review. You need to put them back there because you will need them to support the claims that you are about to make under your data interpretation. You understand? So literature review does not end until you have finished the entire research report and make sure that while you are discussing your findings, you are discussing it within the context of existing knowledge. So your literature review links back to your chapter four, where you are actually doing the actual empirical study, bringing out your research ideas from the field, interpreting the data, presenting the results. All those things that you are doing must be done within the context of the existing knowledge so that if there is any new or emerging knowledge out of your own research, it will be added as a credit. All right. Now, what are the steps in the literature review process? The first step is to search, okay? You need to search for relevant materials or sources, all right? That is the first step. And once you have searched and gotten them, you move to the next step, which is evaluate. I'm sure you were taken to the process of evaluation, but I'll also give you uh, some other principles for evaluation then you will note down key concepts. So as you are reading the text that you have downloaded, you will be noting down the key concepts, the themes, <coughs> what are the convergences and divergences? That is where are the agreements amongst colleagues and where do they disagree on certain issues, strengths, weaknesses, gaps, 
all these things are the things that you exploit to make your own research worthwhile, all right? So very important, you must make sure that when you are reading, you take notes. Note taking is very, very important. And I'll show you some of the tricks that people use in note taking. Then you develop an outline or you structure your discussion based on the notes that you have taken, concepts and things that you have identified, you'll be able to create an outline of how you want to discuss what other people have said within the context of your own problem, all right? So literal review is not something you do by just standing up, getting to the Microsoft Word, and then you start writing. No, you first have to take your time to study the literature very well and understand exactly what the, the patterns and arguments are before you now come and sit down and plot out how you want to also make your argument and use some of the ideas that you have gotten from the extant text as support for your own argument. Then after you have developed that outline, you now start to write and you follow your plot for a logical flow of thought capable of construction. Yeah, deconstruction here means that if you actually follow a logical pattern, we should be able to break down your own argument or ideas or the essay into constituent parts. You understand? Sometimes people write and you start reading, you don't know where this idea is leading, then they bring a different idea that is not associated at all. There's a whole confusion in what they're writing. No, that is why planning your essay is very important. Sit down, plan it. You want to tell us a story. It's just like by the fireside. You realize that when we are telling our folk tales and all those things, the plots have been arranged such a way that it's like maybe let's take a spider okay, or an Anansi story where they say, okay, Anansi was uh, you know, climbing up a, a water snout and then the rain came down and then washed the spider away. Then the sun came up and dried up all the rain. And you know, so the, the things are arranged in such a way that there's a logical flow that you can also deconstruct if you want. Then importantly, since you're actually basing all your arguments on other people's writings, then you must remember to cite them appropriately. Cite them appropriately based on what style is acceptable in your field. At UHAS, I think currently what they are using is the APA. Whether there's going to be a change, I don't know, but we are going to look at it. So you must cite your sources appropriately. And if you are writing for a journal, if it is a publication for a journal, then you must also follow that journal citation style, all right? So that is what it means to cite appropriately. Now, what about evaluating sources? I mentioned that you were already taught this, I think, under information sources or so. So I'm not going to go deep into that, but I have given you some links here in this presentation. I'll make the presentations available. Apart from making the video recording available, the actual PPT or the PowerPoint presentation I'm using right now, I'll make them also available to you on the Moodle uh, course page, okay? So don't worry, before uh, close of today, you'll see all these presentations available for your download. All right, now there is a crap test. Crap test. Here is about currency, it's about um, relevance, about uh, authority, and then all the other communities that you use to try and evaluate a particular source that you have downloaded. Now, these are links, as you can see my pointer here. I've embedded links in here so that you can click on the CRAP principle and go and read about what it is. Then the CAS is also a principle for evaluating online sources. You can also click that link to read more about the CAS principle, all right? Then, of course, I mentioned earlier that you will need to think critically about the text. What kind of questions do you ask? This is also a link. The critical appraisal is a link here to I think the critical thinking course that I mentioned. And I wish that you take time to do that course at your own pace, not as part of the information literacy we are doing now, but after was cry at your own pace, try and take that particular course. You enjoy it. <clears throat> it will help you when you have started doing your research and you realize that you can now engage more academically with other people's writings, okay? And ask the right kinds of questions and also make the right kinds of arguments. So what kind of questions do you ask? Is the context of your study very clear? Okay, when you're evaluating a source, what is the research question or hypothesis? Now, remember here, research questions 
are aligned to qualitative studies. Then hypotheses are aligned to quantitative studies. So depending on the kind of research approach that you are using, if you are a quantitative person, then you'll be looking out for hypotheses. It means the things you are downloading are mostly quantitative uh, literature or text. Then if you are doing a qualitative study, you will not be looking for hypotheses. There are no hypotheses in qualitative studies. Rather, you have research questions, all right? Now, do the methods seem complete? So when you are reading a particular paper, how about the method the person has communicated? Does it look like the method the person is communicating has been completely uh, you know, disclosed? How exactly did the person go about their research? Did they disclose it fully? Okay, what were the good ideas from this paper? That is why if you watch the course I built for you online, there were so many places I asked you to reflect, okay? Reflect on what you have read. Were you able to pick up some relevant ideas? Is there anything in this paper that is so relevant to your research project? You understand? What are those relevant things? Then you note them down, okay? At the same time, you also look for limitations. So does the paper have any limitations? Okay, sometimes these limitations can be communicated by the author himself. The author himself may tell you, okay, these are the limitations of this particular work. And so further studies will be needed in this and that and that areas. You understand? Other times, they may not communicate directly, but you yourself, from reading the paper, you'll be able to recognize what the limitations are. So let's have a look at some of the means by which people do literature evaluation. Okay, people use annotated bibliography, people do critical appraisal, but all these two, critical appraisal and annotated bibliography, they are all important in accomplishing your literature review. The literature review is a more extended one, but you need to annotate your bibliographies, you need to critically appraise or evaluate each, every single paper that you have read, because all of those things will help you to build up your literature review. So from left to right, it is increasing in complexity and you need the first two columns to be able to achieve the last column, which is the literature review. Now, people try to use what they call the literature analysis and synthesis table. So for every single article that you are reading, you pick certain elements, for example, the author, the year, the title, the aims of the paper, <coughs> the method that was used, sample size, the conclusions drawn, then your own comments, okay? This is your own impression about the paper after reading it. All these things help you to be able to have a structure for your literature review, all right? And as I have noted down here, what you are seeing here is not a proposed standard. I'm not saying you must do it the same way, no. Whichever parameters you want to use to evaluate every single paper that you are reading, you are welcome to use it, okay? This is another example. So here, the literature review matrix, this person decides that, okay, this is my research question. Okay, how does vicarious trauma affect emergency care workers in disaster zones? And then the person's primary question is, how can negative effects be prevented? So he asks his own question first. You understand? So this is like an a priori analysis. So he has already tried to, you know, uh, envisage the kinds of things to look out for. In the first case, the first example that I give, you first read the paper and then you make your impressions about the paper. In this example that I'm giving you, the person rather first tries to analyze their own research question and think out what are the aspects that I want to be reading about or answering in my literature discussion. So you see that he mentions the ideas. Okay, I'll have to look for the definition of vicarious trauma. I have to look or discuss things about anxiety effect, fatigue. So he has made all this list. Then he has also stated the various sources that he has downloaded to read. So as he's reading these sources, He'll be looking out for answers to all these things. Have you seen it? It's also another way of trying to analyze your literature so that you can present a very powerful literature review. All right. Then in outlining or structuring your review, 
there are also well-known principles and systems that you use okay for example if you want to use concept map or mind map or whatever it's just similar to using the literature review tables it's all about organizing your own ideas so you ask yourself what are the key concepts or themes that you have identified in these sources that you have read which of the themes are all encompassing that is are there any superordinate themes that contain other sub themes you look for all those things then how are they related any obvious patterns are there agreements are there disagreements or contradictions among the sources okay the various articles that you have read you take note of all these things now what question is driving your theoretical research that is is it being answered i already mentioned this thing so if you had wanted like in the slide we just left okay that person wanted to answer certain specific questions within the literature review so it's your review answering those specific questions you understand uh -huh. so you always have to go back to your research question do you remember that the very first slide when we're trying to describe what the literature review is without word cloud we saw a very important presence of research question you do remember so exactly that is what it is you always have to go back ask yourself what is my research question is it being answered because if you are not answering that question with your review then the review is actually bogus you understand all right so you actually tell us the current or established knowledge the unknowns in that area and which of the unknowns that you really want to focus on that is literature review i hope i am uh, telling somebody something new this morning <laughs> so literature review is an interesting thing but it's time consuming it's something you pay good attention to if you do a good review it will give you a lot of marks okay uh, mr Compson. mr Compson, you can please come through i can see your hand up yes yeah, sir yes yeah thank you so i have a little question for literature review okay. for my understanding yes a literature review is something you research it or something you something you want to research you should need to have available information but there are a number of quiet times sometimes supervisors normally when you you choose a topic then they will tell you do you have available information on this and if you said no then no then i have to give you another one but i also believe in a research both on interest why do you want to research onto something you don't have an interest on can't you can't you any something to do so that you can also improve on a new way of doing things the dynamics because sometimes in a literature review or if you reach from that research they will tell you that there are a lot of available information even though there's no available information on this but then you continue from there but some supervisors will tell you oh, if you don't have available material to support then i'm giving you a different topic okay yeah you are you are absolutely right okay you are absolutely right the problem just like this i want to i won't continue just like what you you, you came after like the the handing over syndrome yes it's a current trend now in, in a health sector Yes. that's somebody taking over from somebody because of financial misfortunes and those things but uh -huh. if it's a new something is coming up why is the supervisor can build upon so that we can improve on something so that you start from somewhere that somebody can also come in in a year by somebody can also continue from the same trend but they will tell you you don't have available uh, material to support so turn this topic down then look for else topics so that we can focus on that okay yes yeah you are right you see the problem with the research that we do and submit to our schools okay for the award of a degree is that the amount of time that is needed to do a, a strong research for scholarly communication may not be available within the school calendar and most of the supervisors are inundated with several supervision uh, roles okay so they want things easy way because they are going to be marking the various sections of your work even though you may have a very innovative idea their point will be that if you are not going to have materials to be able to do a proper literature review which they will be awarded marks to then since they are also not going to be having the time to try and help or guide you in gathering materials you should rather turn it down and look for an easy way out but you see again 
That is why the first session that we had on the resources, you remember that I told you your librarian is also a resource. Okay, once you come up with a topic idea, one of the early things you do, even as I showed with this current presentation is that you quickly have to read around that research idea to see whether you are actually going to have existing literature to support it. And if you are not able to make that up yourself, talk to your librarian. Your librarian will be able to help you quickly within no time at all, come up with all the supporting documents. So that when your supervisor questions you, do you have the, you can prove to him, yes, I have, <laughs> you see? Because yes, I agree with you that you must have an interest in what you are doing. Of course, if you don't have, let's say your supervisor just gives you a topic that you yourself have no idea about. He has even killed your spirit already <laughs> before you start, you see? So yes, I understand and I agree with you absolutely. But I think the reason why they do that is that one, they are not having the time to you know, focus on one particular student to guide them completely because there are several students they are monitoring and they don't want you to have the difficulty uh, of you know, producing the various sections that they'll be marking for a student essay, you see? This one is not a real world research where uh, you want to publish to a scholarly community, even though ideally, ideally, if we're implementing high standards of education, we should be thinking about quality rather than quantity. But here is the case, most of our universities have too many students, you understand, few lecturers and few people in the positions of supervisors for research. And so, they are always constrained with time and resources to be able to do an adequate supervision. In fact, it's a big issue for all tertiary institutions. And so I appreciate your concern. That is the truth. But please, whenever you have a research idea, communicate that first with the university librarian or any of your school librarians, and let us start working together with you so that you can quickly, you know, gather the initial critical mass of uh, literature so that you can prove to your supervisor that you can actually carry out that research with the help of your library resources. Thank you very much. All right, so I hope I have answered you or contributed to your discussion. It is a very nice one you raised and I'm happy about it, uh, Mr. Coulson. And now I'm just going to conclude by showing you some other principles that people use in trying to organize their thoughts. And the first one I'm going to be talking about here is concept maps, okay? As I said, I'll leave this presentation with you so that you see what a concept map looks like. <clears throat> you need to be able to identify a few things around your topic and around the literature that you have read and all the themes you have identified to be able to do a right uh, or a right kind of concept map that will organize your thoughts. So you need your nodes, the nodes are labeled themes. You need your cross links, which are the arrows that show relationships. Then the linking words are phrases you write on the arrows that tell what you mean by linking from one concept to another one. Then the linking words and together with the themes form what you call a proposition or a meaningful sentence, okay? And it is also a hierarchical structure. So for concept maps, you start with the most uh, imposing concept, the superordinate from the top, and then you move down the structure. Let's look at an example of a concept map. This is a concept map about concept maps by Novak, but we are not going to go into this. When you get a PPT, try and understand what it means. But this is an example of a concept map about a cup of coffee. So a cup of coffee is the most superordinate term. You can see it says it contains hot water also contains coffee beans coffee beans naturally have caffeine caffeine can be removed from a cup of coffee caffeine increases mental alertness caffeine inhibits sleep can you see so with the labels okay that you are putting here together with the themes so these are the major themes the ones in the uh, wine rectangles you are seeing these are the major themes, so sleep, hot water, caffeine, coffee beans, mental alertness, all these things are the main themes identified from the text. Now, what 
are the discussions about these things. Those are the propositions you are making using those labels. And so you can see that with a concept map, you can actually read it as a sentence and they make a lot of sense and meaning. The other way around is to use what we call mind maps. A mind map is like what we call problem analysis. So that one, you start from the center. Your major problem, you put it in the middle. Then you try to analyze a problem in its multiple facets, okay? They are very useful tools about mind mapping that you can use. There are even softwares for all of that. What I have done in this presentation, this is an example of a mind map, okay? A mind map about critical thinking. So this man is a critical thinker. And so what are the major ideas emanating from critical thinking? We look at the critical thinking, a thinker's traits, okay? So there are traits. You look at, you look at critical thinking processes. So there are processes. Then you also talk about critical thinkers' questions. So questions, process, traits are the main branches emanating from critical thinking. Then what are the traits? They also branch out to other things. This is a mind map, okay? And uh, I hope it is not too complex for you, but don't worry, you have the slides so you can view it better. Now, how do you write the literature review? I have about five minutes and I want to end within two minutes. In writing a review, first, there should be an overview of your subject. <coughs> that is a broad statement of the importance of the field. Then you should have a logical breakdown of the subject into themes, providing evidence of sources. Then there should be a description or explanation of how your sources support or contradict or provide alternatives to how those themes that you have identified are approached in the particular field. Then you conclude by showing which sources are best considered in their arguments, okay, or which make the greatest contributions to the field of study. Now, very important, while you are doing all this on other people's texts, you demonstrate how your own research contributes to the current debates or fills a gap in knowledge. Now, I have given you a reference to Graf and Bekenstein's They Say, I Say. I believe some of you have already read this title. It's a very important title to read if you really want to know how to write a good literature review, okay? They say, that's the title, They Say, I Say see move that matter in academic writing very useful insights are provided by this particular book and i wish that you can have a copy and study it before you start your research then i always love to ask you know during my explanation i gave the example of an analysis story you know about how we logically arrange things in creative writing this is what they use as what we call a plot structure a plot structure so Always remember that when you are writing, you are telling us a story. So you should logically arrange the events, the themes, the arguments in such a way that when I start reading your work, I get the interest to read and read and read more. So if you take a look at the basic plot structure of most creative writings, you see that they start with exposition. You understand? Which is where you also introduce a topic with background, using statistics, proving the worth of your study and all of that. Then you see that they move into what they call conflict or rising action. That is where the themes and arguments and things begin to fall out. Okay? And then you reach a climax. And you begin to resolve that climax until you get to a resolution. It's an interesting structure of how people think about issues. Now I want to conclude with three minutes left on these notes that first of all, you should understand that literature review is the data collection tool, okay? Don't forget earlier on, I mentioned that you shouldn't forget that data comes in various forms. Qualitative data are mostly textual. So whether you are doing a quantitative or a qualitative research, because of literature review, you will actually be mining text data, which is qualitative data, all right? Now, that data mining process, okay, is like a research process in its own. So literature review can be viewed as a research process by itself. But most of the time, as I mentioned earlier, literature review is done as part of the work that we are already doing in primary research. 
whether you view it as an embedded section within your research work or as a standalone research, literature review is a powerful data collection tool that involves identifying, recording, understanding, making of meaning, and transmitting information. And uh, on this note, I would like to say thank you very much for participating in this class. I have loaded this very slide with several, several, several uh, sources that I consulted before presenting it. So you can actually have access to most of these things online and you'll be able to read for further details. I thank you very much for being part of this second session as well. Now I'll invite questions for only five minutes so that we can uh, start our next session around nine o'clock. And this time it shouldn't be an immediate overlap. We should have some uh, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Hello, Your questions are welcome. Hello, sir. Welcome, boss. Professor, I, wa I wanted to find out whether uh, concept maps are the same as a uh, conceptual framework in research. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good question. Not necessarily. When you say conceptual framework, that can just be a definition of terms, okay, in qualitative research. All right. But it's a good idea to link them. The concept map actually gives you an idea to structure your entire literature review. Do you understand? It is okay. a bigger thing than just a, a framework. When you say a framework, what you mean is that your study that you want to undertake, okay, it is going to go along a certain, you know, precincts or frame. It is the same idea although, the same idea as concept map. You understand? And actually, those who try to illustrate, you know, there are, there are different ways. People simply define the concepts as a conceptual framework. There are people who try to even make a flow diagram or they want to draw it or depict it by in a, an illustration. Now, if you want to do that one, then of course, it will look like a concept map. Okay, so if you want to go for the illustration, then I'll say there's no much difference between the concept map and the conceptual framework that you want to model or draw. But they are not really the same thing. For concept map, we are actually looking at a broader issue of discussions where you are going to bring out details of themes, all right? But for your conceptual framework, you spare us those minute details, okay? It may only be the major themes. So unlike the concept map itself, where you are going to be giving us themes and sub-themes, sub-sub-themes and all those things, and establishing their relationship, that build up to make up the framework for your literature discussion, the conceptual framework is a more simplified version. <coughs> I'm sorry, that may deal only with the major themes that you want to discuss, but not reveal the sub-themes or the minute uh, uh, details, okay? Thank you, sir. All right. Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Victoria. Please, sir, I want to know if there will be a mop-up for your section to when we come to Okay. Okay. Um, that I don't know yet, but uh, let's hope that is possible. I'll be communicating with your course rep. Okay. It depends on your arrangement. I've not seen the timetable yet. I've not seen it yet, honestly. So I'll communicate with your course reps and whatever they tell me, I'll be available. I'm available. So once I get the slot, of course, we'll have a mop-up. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so if there are no more questions. Hello, hello, uh, sir. All right, yes. Uh, please, uh, uh, in fact, the, the your 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 lecture has been very very useful to us because we've already performed certain assignments which uh, we we find it difficult to do researches and I will plead with you that if uh, there could be a session that this, this uh, could be repeated because it's very helpful and mm -hmm. for now we I, I just needed a clarity from something else which is about the 
critical appraisal. Okay. Whether critical appraisal and that of uh, critiquing, is it the same? If it is not the same, I will plead with you if you can do something about the critiquing so that okay. uh, we, we, we have an assignment to do on critiquing. And definitely to me, I'm just abstract about the whole uh, thing. So I will okay. plead with you if you can do something about that. Oh, well, sir, George, it's the same thing. Okay, the same thing. See, to critique is to evaluate somebody's work and, okay, prove uh, their worth in terms of what is good about it, what is not so good about it, what could have been improved, and that kind of thing. It's the same thing with critical appraisal. Critical appraisal simply means that you are reading the text with hawkish eyes. That is, if there's any word like that. Okay, eagle eyes. You, you open your eyes into the text and you try to assess the person in terms of the methods they have used, in terms of the objectives, in terms of their research questions, whether by the time they are concluding, they actually answer the question. You, you actually uh, deconstruct or analyze the entire text in its component parts, okay? Huh. That is what critical appraisal is about. And you see that I gave you some uh, acronyms, like the CRAP, the CAS, and all those things. They are just principles to help you look out for some critical areas that make you evaluate a particular text. And as I said, please, this critical appraisal thing, it goes beyond just looking at the face value of the text. That is why I have recommended that you take that independent course on critical thinking. And I think that we need to start teaching on critical thinking because before you can engage critically with any text, you should have some backgrounds. You should understand what uh, you know, fallacies are so that when you are reading somebody's work, you'll be able to tell a fact from a fallacy. You should be able to determine what an argument is. You understand all these things are skills that you develop outside of what you are presenting right now. But they are the ones that help you to do a critical analysis of text. That is why I really wish that you follow that recommendation, try and do the enough, enough course. Not as part of what is examinable, no, no, nobody's going to examine you on that. But I just feel you need it to help you, especially before you start your research proper. By that time, if you're able to understand these principles, you'll be able to engage so academically with whatever text you'll be reading and you yourself will be happy how you're able to make arguments. All right. Hello, sir. Yes, please, Aaron. Yeah. Um, I would like to know if you can, um, in any way, influence or facilitate our uh, getting of the user um, names, as in the email addresses, because... The email address, you, okay. Yeah, the you has email addresses. I'm sorry to yes. be a prerequisite to some of the subsequent lectures that you'll be giving us. Exactly. Yeah, so <laughs> okay. if you can in any way assist with the, as, uh, getting the ICT the department to do it for us, we'll be grateful. Okay, I will definitely do that. I'll definitely okay. do that. So this is the 2019-2020 group, right? Y yes. 29th, okay, very good. So I will try and li liaise with my colleagues at the ICT department and see about this. I'm sure they already have the data. Okay. So, yes, please, I will work on that definitely uh, within the day. Let's hope uh, our time is already going. But before the next session, I would have spoken with the gentleman resp uh, responsible at the ICT. So, in our next session, which is starting maybe around nine o'clock, I guess. Uh, I will be able to give you some feedback, all right, and see how far and uh, if he's able to complete maybe within the day, then you can have access to them. I also saw a question from the chats from uh, Al Hassan Abdurrahman. Okay, you said I should kindly explain this statement carve a niche for your research by identifying gaps. Yes, what I mean by that is that you see. In literature review, you are reading other people's work. These people are making arguments, okay? And their arguments are the things that you are identifying to make your own new arguments or propositions. 
those that you agree with, you cite them. Even the ones that you do not agree with, you try to show us that you don't agree with this particular person's position. So carving a niche here means that you have established knowledge on the field and you know that these are the things that people are saying. So that helps you to identify whether your own topic is relevant. If your topic is relevant, then it means that it has a space within the scholarly discourse. That is the niche. That is that special gap that you are feeling. Okay. <coughs> that is what I mean by that. Sorry. Yes, Mr. Bafu. Uh, please, I want to know if the next class, uh, if you are using the same username and then the password. Thank you. No, please. No, please. Each session has its own uh, URL. So I'm going to share that right now once we close from here. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I can't admit any more questions now. It's exactly 8.40. At least I promised 20 minutes before the start of the next one. So I'll share the next login details with you through your course rep right now. And I thank you very much for the participation. It's been great. We had about 250 people. I'm so grateful. And I hope that at 9 o'clock, we'll make time again to continue. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. You're welcome.